According to an American author and motivational speaker, Zig Ziglar, he said, and I quote, The foundation stones for a balanced success are honesty, character, integrity, faith, love, and loyalty. Let's do the right thing at all times. Thanks for joining us on another episode of The Eagle. My name is Aisha Mohammed. Hello out there. My name is Abdul Rashid Bawa. I'm the executive chairman of Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. The fight against corruption is our collective responsibility. I therefore urge you to please put in your best and help the EFCC achieve its mandate of ridding Nigeria of economic and financial crimes. Together, we can win the fight, and we will win the fight. The Postmaster General and Chief Executive of the Nigerian Postal Service, NIPOST, Ismail Adebayo Adewusi, has reiterated his desire to strengthen ties with the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, for the mutual benefit of the two agencies. This was disclosed when he paid a cut visit to the EFCC headquarters in Jabi, Abuja. Amina Kawa has the details. Adi also said, though NIPOS has recorded German disclosure, it is still beset by challenges occasioned by technological changes which disrupted its services. He, however, acknowledged that the changes have also created opportunities. The NIPOS boss disclosed that his agency recently perfected address verification which he said will help security agencies in checking the address of suspects. He further sought the intervention of the EFCC bus in tracking and reporting on the status of cases of theft by officials of NIPOS that was reported to the commission. In his response, the EFCC chairman, Abdul Rashid Bawa, expressed appreciation to the Postmaster General for his visit and good wishes. Recalling the history of collaboration between the EFCC and NIPOS, Bawa said, he could remember as a young officer in Lagos that the Commission, NIPOS, and the U.S. Postal Inspection Service used to carry out mail interdiction exercise, which led to the recovery of several scam mails and the impounding of counterfeit financial instruments. He, however, observed that, unlike in the past, when NIPOS could intercept scam mails and counterfeit financial instruments and send them to the Commission, that is not happening again. We appreciate the Nigerian Postal Services for all the support and cooperation. I remember very well uh, as a young officer in Lagos, you know, at uh, your international mail processing center, you normally have these tripartite operations between uh, your agency, U.S. Postal Service in particular, and the EFCC. He also noted certain challenges in mail handling, which he would like the Postmaster General to address. They include delays in the delivery of mail, and the non-delivery of others on the ground that the address was not traceable. The EFCC chairman commended the innovation by NIPOS in the verification of addresses, saying that the commission will key into the program to verify address of suspects and even staff members. He assured that the commission will continue to patronize NIPOS. Amina Kawa, reporting for The Eagle. Justice Chuku Jeku Aneke of the Federal High Court sitting in Ikoyi, Lagos, has ordered the final forfeiture of the sum of 3,719,855 dollars 94 cents found in the account of a company, Enebet International Limited, to the federal government. Justice Aneke gave the order following an expert application filed by the EFCC. Again, Amina Kawa is our guide. The judge had on June 18, 2021, ordered the interim forfeiture of the money and also directed anyone with lawful interest in the money to show cause why it should not be finally forfeited to the federal government. In granting the interim forfeiture, the judge had also directed the publication of the order in a national newspaper. In an affidavit in support of the application, the commission, through its counsel, Rotimi Oedepo, had told the court that the sum was part of credit inflows of $8,360,444.43, which 
received by the firm and reasonably suspected to be proceeds of an unlawful activity. Oedipo also told the court that the sums were secretly transferred to conceal and retain in the account number 46949760024 opened in the name of Enerbert International Limited and domiciled in First City Monument Bank, PLC. He further told the court that the sum of $4,640,398.33 had already been wasted by suspect in the suit marked FHC slash L slash CS slash 586 slash 2021. He added that as of 31st day of May 2021, the said account had witnessed credit inflows to the tune of $8,360,444.43, which sums are reasonably suspected to be proceeds of a lawful activity. That before the intelligence was received and acted upon by the Commission, the company and its cronies had dissipated the total sum of $4,640,398.33, leaving a balance of $3,720,046.10. Also that, as of 31st day of May 2021, the balance turned into the credit of the said account was 3 million seven hundred and twenty thousand forty six dollars ten cents in his ruling justice anaki held that the application was meritorious and ought to be granted the judge also held that in light of the above reasons he thereby ordered the final forfeiture and the same be forfeited to the federal government of nigeria amina kawa reporting for the eagle according to wikipedia Corruption is an antisocial attitude awarding improper privileges contrary to legal and moral norms and impairs the authorities' capacity to secure the welfare of all citizens. Corruption is a constant phenomenon in Nigeria and it is a bane to development. Today on The Ego, we are taking a look at corruption on internally displaced persons in Nigeria and how it is affecting their well-being. Aisha Gambari is our guide on this. According to the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, over 3.2 million people are displaced, including over 2.9 million internally displaced persons in the northeastern Nigeria. These displaced persons were people sacked from various villages across the northeastern states of Barno, Yobe, Bauchi, Adamawa, and Gombe states in Nigeria. The worst hit are Barano and Yobe, where the Islamist group, also known as Boko Haram, held sway before the intervention of the Nigerian military in the early 2004. Seven years down the lane, the battle to regain control of the territories occupied by the Boko Haram sect is ongoing, leaving more and more people displaced. Children, women and men who escaped being killed or kidnapped or being forced to join the sect had to find shelters elsewhere in order to save their lives. This resulted in the provision of a number of makeshift settlements and camps for internally displaced persons across the country. Some of these camps are located in Abuja, where displaced persons from Bama, Goza, and some other villages invaded by Boko Haram in Barunu and Yobe are currently being sheltered. The population of IDPs in these camps is over 20,000. This figure includes adults and children. The camps are located in areas like Lube, Area 1, New Kuchingoro, and Pegi in Kuje Area Council. These camps are meant to help internally displaced persons to find temporary refuge until it is safe to return to their various permanent settlements and homes. The camp largely depends on donations from government and other well-meaning citizens who provide them with items such as food, clothing, medicine, toiletries and other household items. The Eagle team paid a visit to the Area 1, Kuchingoru and Kuji IDP camps to distribute items to them and also to know how they are faring 
at the camps. Liatsu Ayuba is the women leader at the Area 1 camp. Because of the issue of Boko Haram, and the attack on my, my state, because my husband is working in my state, they killed my husband and my son stayed bomb blast, and they took me from Borno State to Abuja for the treatment. She said the condition of the camp is deplorable, but since they don't have a choice, they will have to endure the hardship. But the condition is very critical. Because some of our women here, yes, um, you can see women and the children here, yeah, we are so far. You can see the tents that we are living inside. Even the tents, the nylon that we put it on top of the tent, the uh, sun eats the nylon. It will not get strong again. During this race, all of our children and the mothers, we are suffering because the rain are dropping inside the tent. And that is why some of the children are suffering from cough, fever. If you look at the body of the children, you can, you can see like uh, the place, the, the, they will start to scr uh, scratching their body, the place will swallow up. If you press them, you will get warm, warm will come out from the place because the tent, not be every, it's not everybody has money to flow the, the tent and no ventilations. Ayuba said, apart from the lack of proper shelter, the increase in health challenges posed by the poor condition of living is of great concern to her. Even the day before yesterday, they come to do uh, hepatitis B uh, test here. Most of our children and the women are affected because we don't have uh, ventilation. No ventilation and some of the children, some of the youth, they don't have any place to sleep. They are just sleeping in the primary school, sleeping in the car, sleeping on, the, on top of the machine that they are driving because we don't have tents. That is why some of the children and the men and the youth and the women are the hepatitis is positive. I'm very, very angry yesterday. I cried too much because of this thing. And not any help from any another government to help us. But some of the people that are visiting here from outside, they are just come and look how we people are living in this tent and they think are surprising them. They say, how comes? Um, the, the, the government, the Nigerian governments are telling us that they build the estate for, for the ITBs uh, sleep, as, as sleeping inside, but we, we didn't see it. I said, Tom, that is why we are TP. We are crying. She also said the lack of adequate health facilities has been a great challenge to the pregnant women as they lack prenatal, antenatal, and postnatal care and have to rely on help from some of the women who have little experience of birthing children. Liatu added that even the children have not been humanized. Government are trying, but the people that are on top of this thing that they, they must to bring to the IDPs now is, is the people that are inviting everything, but government are giving it. The residents of the camp, who have been living there for over five years, said they mostly depend on donations from individuals and non-governmental organizations who visit the camps. Items such as food, clothes, medicine, toiletries, and small household items, when donated, are shared amongst them according to the number of persons in each household. Another resident of the Area 1 IDP camp, Naomi Sule, who spoke to the Eagle team in Hausa, said her baby was delivered by the woman leader, Liatsu Ayuba. Sule added that, as a show of appreciation, she named the baby after the woman leader. I came to this camp three years ago from Goza, Borono State, after the Boko Haram insurgents sacked our village. They came to our village at about 2 p.m., shooting and killing people. We had to run to a nearby village through the bush path for safety. We were there for a few days after which the insurgents raided the village again and we had to keep running. It was after running for two days in the forest that we found some rescuers who facilitated our transportation to this place. Amina Alajizubairu is also a resident of the area one Abuja IDP camp. Her fate is similar to all other IDPs who found themselves at the camp. In her own case, 
She said her husband and her brother were killed by the Boko Haram insurgents right in front of her. Amina, who also narrated her ordeal in Hausa, said, When the Boko Haram invaded their village, women and children were spared initially, but all the men were killed. She said, A second visit to the village by the insurgents led to the kidnap of a number of women, and only a few of them who managed to escape were transported by rescuers and volunteers to Abuja. The reason why we are here is because Boko Haram attacked us in our village. They slaughtered many of us. At the time, mostly men. But when we ran away, many people that we left behind said the insurgents came back and a lot of the villagers didn't make it. When the Boko Haram came, some of us hid our children inside the roof and ran away. By the time some of us went back after the news filtered that the insurgents had left, they got killed on the way back by the Boko Haram. We first ran to Meduguri, but when Meduguri was also being attacked, we left and found our way to Abuja. Apart from women, a number of children whose parents were killed were also rescued by volunteers and brought to the camp. A lot of them are being taken care of by volunteers or family members who found them at the camp. As they all narrate the tales of their ordeals, one wouldn't but wonder and feel pity for them going through such experiences. When the insurgency started in 2012, concerted efforts were made by the federal government to arrest the situation. Certain steps were taken in order for the military to be well equipped and mobilized to wage a war against the insurgency. One of such steps was the procurement of arms and ammunition for which the sum of $2.1 billion was released for the procurement processes. This money, it was later discovered, never went into the purpose for which it was released. In the course of investigations by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, the said sum was discovered to have been diverted for fictitious services that were never rendered and later found its ways to the private pockets of individuals saddled with the responsibility of ensuring the procurement of arms. Top-serving and retired military officers and politicians were discovered to have been culpable in this regard. Some invested in private estates, while others stashed millions of dollars in their wardrobes. How much do you have in one, two, three, four, five? Now it is estimated to be fifty thousand dollars. Yes, ten thousand per punch. Fifty. While the free stealing and sharing lasted, hundreds of soldiers were dying on the battlefield. Many women were raped, children were kidnapped and rendered orphans. Thousands of innocent lives, lost, houses and properties were also destroyed. The continuous attack on villages by the sect led to the displacement of over 2 million people who had to seek refuge in camps across the country where they contend with the harsh realities of survival. One of the flanks of the war being waged by the EFCC is now leading to the recovery of the diverted arms procurement funds as the commission from city to city combed every nook and cranny of the country to trace and confiscate all the assets traced to the missing funds. In Maitama, Abuja, Nigeria, one of the retired generals involved in the bazaar acquired a massive and tastefully furnished building 
sitting on 2,400 square meters of land. Several other buildings in highbrow locations in Abuja and Lagos, including the shopping plaza, were said to have been recovered from the said general. The plaza, whose construction was valued at about 2 billion naira, is located in Wusetu, Abuja, and has the capacity to accommodate dozens of offices, restaurants and bars, which belong to the same person. The properties have since been forfeited to the federal government of Nigeria. All the properties traced to the missing arms procurement fraud, whose final forfeiture has been secured by the EFCC include a mansion under construction on Ethiop Close, Maitama Abuja, worth 600 million naira, another on Panama Close, also in Abuja, worth 450 million naira, an estate on Isia Kurabu Avenue, Wuse to Abuja, valued at roughly 2 billion naira, was also recovered and forfeited to the federal government. On Kumasi Street, Wuse to Abuja, is another duplex worth 320 million naira, another edifice worth 495 million naira on Agada Street, Wuse to Abuja, and one on Lake Chad Street, Metama Abuja, worth 670 million naira, were also forfeited to the federal government of Nigeria. In high-brow areas of Lagos, Nigeria, the EFCC also confiscated and secured a final forfeiture order of a hospital and a number of other choice properties worth over 5 billion naira. Apart from the arms deal, other individuals saddled with the responsibility of delivering food items and other relief materials to the internally displaced persons also diverted them for private gains. The items, which were provided by the federal government, were said to have found their ways into shops and markets across many cities in the country. The EFCC again rose up to this challenge. A number of persons found wanting in this regard were also arrested and charged to court by the commission. The EFCC Gumbezuna office on March 13, 2020, secured the conviction of one Dr. Dalami Arab Rukije and Isa Garba before Justice Abubakar Joru of the Gumbe State High Court on a three counts charge bordering on conspiracy, criminal misappropriation, aiding and abating. Rukije, while being the executive secretary of the Gumbe State Emergency Management Agency, was said to have conspired with the Garba, the store officer of the same agency, to cut away some building materials meant to alleviate the sufferings of the internally displaced persons in the state. The materials which include 5,000 bags of cement and 4,000 drums of 20 liters paint were provided by the Presidential Committee for the Northeast Development Initiative and were sold by the convicts and proceeds diverted to their personal benefits. The EFCC will however not relent in its effort at ensuring that every individual found culpable in the commission of any form of economic and financial crimes faces the wrath of the law. Aisha Gambari, reporting for The Eagle. Well, you heard right. The EFCC will get you anywhere, anytime, and if found guilty, you will surely face the wrath of the law. And that's how we wrap up today's episode of The Eagle. You can kindly send your inquiries and suggestions on anything about the EFCC to info at efcc.nigeria.org or search and follow us on all our social media platforms at official EFCC. Please also download the new EFCC Eagle Eye app and send your reports with ease. See something, say something, and sure the EFCC will do something about it. Before I leave, here are some parting words from Brian Pulsifer who said, One of most prized possession is integrity. You should never compromise it. Do the right thing, always. My name is Aisha Muhammad. From all of us here, it's goodbye. God bless Nigeria. And please, be kind to one another. Thank you.